Okay. Yes. So German coal mine operator, coal mine operator RWE, I was told by one of my interviewees, makes two products: cheap electricity and pretty new landscapes. These pretty new landscapes are meant to compensate for the destruction of the ancient Hambacher forest to give way to the what's called migrating mine, the world's largest open cast lignite coal mine, the Hambach mine. Since the beginning of the 20th century, the Rhineland has been mined for lignite coal. And ever since, coal mining in the Rhineland was not only entangled with what Xander and I have called corporate and counter counterinsurgency efforts to de delegitimize anti-mining resistance, including PR works to paint RWE as sustainable, CSR programs to buy consent, and brute force um, uh, deployed against land defenders and journalists to facilitate the dispossession and displace displacement of human and non-human communities until today. But it has, hold, uh, has also gone hand in hand with greening extraction. These pretty new landscapes lie at the heart of these greening efforts, but they're embedded in a whole range of activities and discourses. So in my talk today, I'll be arguing that green or the greening of extractivism through conservation and ecological repair work has always been integral to coal mining in the Rhineland. It needs to be understood not only as counterinsurgency, but also in relation to spectacularization, imaginations and green fantasies of domination and masculinity. It is marketed by an entire PR apparatus that creates imaginaries of a better nature and a better future, which requires a spectacular performance of sustainability that facilitates accumulation by restoration and is grounded in the ontological flattening and erasure of existences to facilitate claims of commensurability and green extractivism. The Hambach coal mine started operating in 1978, still operating, and was initially planned to cover 85 square kilometers, absolutely enormous. The mine constitutes Europe's largest source of CO2 emissions and displaced countless human and non-human animals, destroyed ecosystems, including the 12,000 year old uh, Hambacher Forest, one of the most ancient forests of Europe, um, and numerous threatened species. It is operated by electricity provider and self-proclaimed energy giant RWE, the single biggest European emitter. RWE is structurally entrenched in the German and European political landscape with particularly close links to the police and occupies a uniquely powerful position in the German political economy. Many local municipalities hold shares in RWE, thus relying on RWE's financial well-being for their budgets. There are countless revolving door relationships and many national and regional politicians are or have been on RWE's payroll. But the Hambach mine has always been fiercely resisted by citizen initiatives, mass protests, and since 2012, a forest occupation that has successfully protected the remaining bit of the ancient forest through direct action, physical resistance, blockades, and sabotage. The resistance is, uh, resistance is subject to coercive repression and state and corporate violence, including physical violence, beatings, lawsuits, stigmatization of criminals and eco-terrorists, intimidation, and rape and death threats. So Xander and I analyzed these as counterinsurgency measures, including not just the coercion and the direct physical violence against forest defenders, but also a wide variety of CSR, PR, outreach activities to engineer and by consent and brainwash to, uh, school children and to legitimize and invisibilize the violent repression against forest defenders and other activists. But key to this repression of resistance, I suggest, have been the su sustained efforts to green RWE's operations, to create an image of sustainable coal mining and responsible corporate behavior. First, um, and here you can kind of see the way I kind of divide these greening operations into kind of four important themes. First, and key to the greening of extractivism is the investment in conservation that claims to compensate and offset the ecological damage caused by mining. As an RWE coal mine manager stated at the 2017 annual recultivation conference, 
compensatory, compensatory recultivation is a business card for us mining companies. It continues to be important to us to remain a reliable neighbor. To compensate for the loss of the 12,000 year old and highly biodiverse Hambacher forest, the company created the offset site Sophienhöhe, the largest artificial mountain in the world, covering 13 square kilometers, almost 300 meters high, and praised by RWE for its ecological success. The restoration and artificial forestation of the area, following reclamation, blending, and depositing of soil, forms the heart of its biodiversity management plan and is key to its presentation as green. Sophienhöhe contains 150 kilometers of hiking and cycling trails leading to visitor points on top of the hills and different called eye catchers, including a Celtic tree circle, lookouts and a giant redwood trail, as well as initially a Mufflin wild park. The company offers guided tours and maps of the offsetting site regular events and scientific tours. There are several other smaller offsetting projects, including this bat highway that is meant to connect remaining fragments of old forest to offset the loss of rare bat habitats. RWE further sells offsets or eco points for compensation measures to developers and municipalities, which it generates by enhancing and upgrading natural areas the so-called upgrade of a spruce forest to a beech tree forest, or converting agricultural land into grasslands, or planting orchard, or constitute compensatory measures. And these eco points then allow for no net loss claims by other developers and municipalities. Behind these compensation measures, there's a whole corporate PR machinery that promotes RWE's restoration work as not only leading to a net gain in trees, but creating a better nature as well as a net gain of nature, as these interviews state. This, uh, this goes hand in hand with the framing of the mine as migrating, not expanding, and temporarily taking over land rather than causing irreversible destruction. This better nature is meant to bring about a better future, which I'll come back to later and reconcile different interests, as you see on the quotes. As one RWE interview told me, the great thing is that the restoration work is better than what was there before. We can plan a new landscape. It's a unique opportunity. We can accommodate all interests. These offsets are not just new habitats, but they themselves um, and the open cast mines become sites of, extra, uh, of attraction, or what I call extractive attractions, that are key to RWE screening. RWE offers regular tours through the mines and the offset sites, as already mentioned, um, environmental education programs for kids, as you can see at the bottom left, and recreational uh, uh, opportunities. I already mentioned the um, cycling and hiking infrastructure on Zephyr and Her, signposted with big maps and promotional material, QR codes to learn more about recultivation, coal mining, and RWE as well as lots of additional features such as the Celtic tree circle that you see here on the middle, um, old Roman infrastructures and much more. I look at this turning conservation into extractive attractions through the lens of Debord's spectacle as a way to shape people's perception of the world, here RWE and coal and their social and ecological relationships. Spectacle, Devor has argued, imposes a sense of unity in situations of fragmentations, legitimizing and justifying political systems and dominant power relations and stipulating consumption as the only way of engaging with the world. It is grounded in the pre presentation of the world as quantifiable and commensurable, creating the appearance of exchangeability while concealing conflicts and contradictions reifying the same conditions, alienation, and relationships it is based on. And this spectacularization is a recurring theme in RWE's greening initiatives and help shapes, it helps shape its image as green and trustworthy, mediating people's relationships to RWE and coal as tourists, as neighbors, as consumers. You see here a photo of their wind power operations that are positioned all around the mine, nicely visible from the highway nearby, and the solar panels that run along the highway, which allegedly, I was told by residents, 
for years weren't actually connected to the grid, but they were purely there to communicate a green image to um, those driving past. Next, you see some pictures from RWE's 2009 advertising video that was meant to establish the company as environmental leader, but caused controversy because of blatantly false insinuations about invest its investments into renewable energy. RWE appears as sweet-natured energy giant, a phrase they use in much of the advertising material themselves, resembling Disney um, character Shrek, actively restoring and repairing the natural environment that was devastated by coal mining. So the advert was shown uh, prior to cinema screenings of Shrek Paw and Harry Potter, explicitly targeting, of course, uh, children and their parents. Along to the popular children's song, I Love the Mountains, and with trees growing on its shoulders, the friendly giant spends all day erecting windmills, building tidal power stations, repairing grid infrastructure, and most importantly for us here, moving mountains, planting trees, sowing plants, and rolling out lawn to create the better nature it promises. The spectacularization of conservation links back to the extractive attractions and what Bisher and Davidov have coined the tourism, eco ecotourism extraction nexus where here in this case, not just coal mining operations, but also offset sites become tourist destinations. In addition, numerous museums, exhibitions, platforms, and skywalks attract entire busloads of visitors from neighboring Belgium and the Netherlands. What is important here is the way both coal mining and RWE's recultivation work are presented, grounded in particular human nature, relationships of control and domination, appealing to visitors' fascination with big machinery, the largest mobile machines in the world, steered through the most up-to-date GPS technologies and other technological superlatives, which symbolize modernity, progress, and a particular type of masculinity that I come back to later. Here you see some of the skywalks and visitors pla visitor platforms um, that RWE has built with state support, of course, and the Mines TripAdvisor page. And then last, we have here RWE's Visitor and Enta Entertainment Center, fittingly named Terra Nova, New Earth, a restaurant, bar, and information center modeled after a beach resort with sunbeds, playground, and outdoor gym that sits on a terrace overlooking the mine. Again, this is a key attraction for visitors and hosts regular music concerts, has a wedding room, and a football golf course. It also hosts RWE's Recultivation Center, which is responsible not just for the nature restoration work the company, company conducts, but also their regular recultivation conferences. And here we come to the third way of greening extractivism, and that is through the cooperation of green critics. The Sophie and Her presents an ideal laboratory for researchers investigating ecosystem restoration, animal and plant behavior, and species diversity in artificial environments and for conservationists, environmentalists, and naturliebhaber or nature lovers, local volunteers, to collect data on orchards, butterflies, insects, and other things. Scientists, conservationists, coal mine managers, and the interested public are invited to mingle at these regular conferences to have tea and coffee and to discuss its success. Local volunteers' contributions to RWE's restoration and their data collection um, are showcased, renowned scientists and political figures are invited to speak. So this is one way in which RWE's nature conservation work helps divide and conquer the environmental community. In return for being given this praise and this platform, I was told by um, conservationists, many conservationists abstain from criticizing RWE's mining operations, their climate impacts and destruction, the destruction of the Hambacher Forest. The annual conference is embedded in a series of almost weekly events and tours to market and promote RWE's restoration work, hikes and excursions, deer safaris, the public lecture series, and a number of outdoor events targeting children and adults. And the research center is not only responsible for the planning and implementation of RWE's recultivation work and these conferences, but appears to undertake PR and stakeholder outreach promoting the company's biodiversity management to external parties, student groups, and politicians, 
I once joined a tour through the offsetting site guided by the RWE recultivation team with a group of politicians from the Conservative Party. It wasn't pleasant. Um, and in other words, they communicate RWE's greenness tailored to the respective audience they talk to. The better nature that the mine operator alleges to create is thus a product of this collaboration with conservation groups and co volunteers that lends um, the legitimacy needed for such claims and then forms the basis for the new coal tourism and conservation experiences of nature lovers. There are many more partnerships and examples of cooptation, including a well-known and widely criticized with IUCN, which was particularly important because it was through this partnership that RWE started adopting and embracing the language of no net loss, the mitigation hierarchy, um, and offsetting to improve their social license to operate. And of course, with academics. Here you see the announcement of a summer school around post mining recultivation that is happening in two months. And last, I want to see, say a few words about the fourth way in which greening extraction works, and that is really through a focus on eco modernist visions of a green future. When I showed you the images of RWE's recultivation, information, and entertainment center, Terra Nova, you may have noticed that it's modeled after a beach resort with parasols, beach chairs, a playground shaped like a shipwreck, dunes with coastal vegetation, etc. And that is not a, co a coincidence, but due to the fact that the Hambach mine is meant to be turned into Germany's second largest lake over the next 60 years, up to 400 meters deep and meant to be filled with 4 billion liters of water. Not quite clear where that's meant to come from. The lake ecosystem is scheduled to be finished um, by 2080, but the company is already promoting a rise in property prices and the possibility for luxury apartments and touristic developments. And that focus on a green future allows RWE to paint the extraction as green despite the ongoing ecological and social devastation um, and is key to the greening of um, their discourses. They have formed an agency of the future where together with MPs on their payroll, local municipalities who are RWE shareholders and chambers of commerce, they promote and lobby for their own vision of a green transition. And this focus on the future then, benefit, uh, then allows for the invisibilization of past and present harm and violence. Extraction and conservation, political ecologists, including Philippe Le Bion recently have shown, share some of the same underlying assumptions, values, and imaginations. There's nothing inherent to conservation that contradicts extractivist logics, right? Extraction and conservation, I quote, bring about new imaginaries of places and re-territorialize them through regimes of exception that seek to rule and legitimize particular forms of exclusion and inclusion, Le Bignon has argued. Both are the product of colonialism and the making of modernity based on human nature separations and hierarchies that are inherently exploitative and exclusive. And in the German Rhineland, I argue, both nature restoration and coal mining are grounded in similar logics, uh, ideal, ideologies and logics of control that are informed by particular masculinities and fantasies of domination. Both rely on an unquestioned belief in the human or rather corporate ability to control, recreate and repair habitats or even rebuild or make them from scratch like Sophie and her. Grounded in and entrenching further quantification and ontological flattening and reductionism. It's all about the net number of trees at the end of the day. Both involve the playing with huge machinery, digging up soil, shifting huge amounts of earth, making holes and building mountains. The open cast mining industry shifts more soil than any other sector. It's an industry that has mastered the domination of nature and an industry that has historically <coughs> celebrated this mastery of nature, the idea of managing and dominating nature in the interest of human progress. Here you see an old German song of the miner composed to describe coal mining in 1802. You see not only the celebration of the mastery over nature, but also its relation to masculinity and patriarchy. The earth is feminized, exploited, extracted from. Ecofeminists like Caroline Merchant have long compared extraction to rape of the earth to penetration and coercion. 
And while the mining industry has long been analyzed through this lens of masculinity, or in Ward's words, hypermasculinity, Carol Daggett has recently coined the term petromasculinity to describe the way fossil fuels shape identities and how these masculinities shape relations around fossil fuels. She examines how fossil fuels held up white patriarchal rule. And other examples for this, which I don't have the time to go into, are the, the rape threats and jokes uh, about rape that one encounters quite frequently around um, the management of dissent in Hamburg. But what I'd like to emphasize here is that this masculinist logic or fantasy of control and domination is visible in RWE's restoration work too, where we see both a degree of reactionary patromasculinity, as she calls it, defending fossil capitalism, and the continuation of mining and defense of good, honest mining jobs, combined with a more eco-modernist masculinity that celebrates nature restoration. But both are grounded in these fantasies of control, contributing to further alienation, treating nature as laboratory, a resource to be molded according to one's liking. And just another example of this is on the right with some quotes from the Sustainable Coal Forum 2017, um, in London, where that same eco-modernist rationality is at play. Uh, interestingly, mentioning environmental NGOs supporting this narrative. It's not about keeping it in the ground, it's about keeping it out of the air, as you know, referring to carbon capture and storage, of course. The effects of this greening include accumulation by restoration, which I won't go into now, but we we'll talk about in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, the concentration of land ownership in the hands of fewer and fewer farmers' hands is also a type of land grabbing. The entrenching of nature as substitutable, commensurable, and further alienation. And just to sum up, this is my last slide. Um, greening extraction or green extractivism, I argue, is not new. It's the continuation of colonial conservation and extractivism and exploitation. Col conservation has a long colonial history of acting in the service of empire or corporations. So think about um, preservation of um, yeah, animals for hunting, for instance, or, um, or trees for, for ships, for instance. And here greening through conservation and repair work is to protect extraction and to contribute to accumulation by restoration. And while biodiversity offsetting specifically is often positioned as new, part of neoliberal trends of marketization and financialization of nature, the long history of compensation and recultivation in the Rhineland shows that this has always been integral to their operations to manage and suppress this dissent and invisibilize the violence both conducted through coal mining, but also the violence against those who are trying to protect habitats. It became reframed to fit hegemonic neoliberal or environmental economic languages, reframed from responsibility towards communities, um, towards a language of no net loss, fungibility, equivalence, equivalence, etc., to fit into the ideology of cost benefit analysis and environmental accounting. The creation of a better nature as part of greening extraction is based on the very same processes of classification, quantification, and measuring of life what Moreno and others have called ecological epistemicide, ignoring interconnections and social relations to the land and enabling claims of net gain, net gains of trees. So it contributes to alienation, individualization, denial of interconnectivity, to making nature commensurable, legible and controllable, requiring continuous surveillance, monitoring and careful management, including, of course, by RWE. So what I tried to highlight is that greening extraction has always been about greening imaginaries and imaginations, green fantasies, colonization of minds, about visibility and spectacle, but also about emotions and feelings. Deschanel and Patterson have spoken about affective attachments in relation to carbon offsets, and I think that works really well here too. These imaginaries are grounded in the same colonial patriarchal fantasies of control over nature, of engineering as ideology and patromasculinities. This is about shaping, improving, playing with nature, mixing soils and seeds, perfecting composition to upgrade nature, and it is grounded in the human or 
corporate ability or belief in the ability to recreate nature, a fascination with huge earth shifting machinery and a commitment to what James C. Scott would call high modernist ideologies of control. Thank you.